I'm oh. sorry. I just I just can't react until he says that word. <laughs> Stephen, what part of New Jersey did you grow up in? I grew up. Did I grow up? <laughs> I guess I did. Um, Middletown, New Jersey. Right in the middle. Okay. And uh, moved down to Asbury Park. I forget when, sometime in the late sixties, I guess. What were your first uh, New Jersey musical influences? Um, you mean on the radio? Mm -hmm. Oh, God, I guess, um, well, the first record I bought was uh, Little Anthony and the Imperials, Tears on My Pillow. Um, I would buy a record occasionally. I wasn't really, um, I guess, a big record collector or anything. Um, I remember the, uh, the coasters and, uh, you know, Duke of Earl, things like that. And uh, the Four Seasons were very big. Always loved the Four Seasons, still do. We just got through interviewing Frankie Valley, ah. which was really fun, yeah. Yeah. How did you first become interested in music? Um, I don't know, I guess it was just uh, like anybody else. You hear something on the radio that really gets you, you know, moves you. Um, for some reason, I, I think back on uh, this record, Pretty Little Angel Eyes, I remember it actually having an effect on me other than I like that song, you know. And I played it over and over and wore it out. Um, and that's really how it starts. I mean, it just gets in your blood. And um, it wasn't until the uh, British invasion, as we called it, I guess it will be now be called the first British invasion, um, that I really wanted to play, you know. Uh, you know, the Stones and the Beatles and the Who and, uh, and those guys. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about um the Asbury Park bar scene. How did that sort of all come together and, and what was that all like? Well, it was rather depressing for the most part. It, it, at first, um, we would put together one band after another and we couldn't get work really. Nobody wanted to hire bands that were playing any kind of original music or anything that even suggested anything other than the top 40. Uh, you had to play the, the hits on the radio to work. Um, the exception to the rule was this place called the Upstage Club. Um, and they would encourage young people to come and just play whatever they wanted to. And that's where we met a lot of people, you know, we um, Bruce had gone down and said, you know, come on down, this is a real interesting scene. And I went down and uh, that's where we met Southside and Gary Talent and everybody. Um, and you'd go, you know, at nine o'clock at night and you'd play until five or six in the morning. And there was no alcohol, not legally, you know. And, um, and that was a very healthy thing, actually, you know. I understand you were sort of like the house guitar player there for a while. Well, I was one of them, yeah. Yeah, which was a big deal because if you got there and you were good, you could play all night and you'd make five dollars. Uh, if you became the house, you know, arranger or whatever, then you got fifteen, which was, you know, big money. And um, you had to really work your way up. It was. Kind of interesting. Yeah. What do you think uh, it was about Asbury Park that, that caused or, or bred this camaraderie among musicians? <clears throat> the existence of that club, really. It, it, um, I can't exaggerate its importance. I mean, um, 
one club makes a scene, you know, makes a... Uh, it was kind of, I mean, Asbury Park was sort of in the middle of everything. Uh, uh, for us, I mean, coming down from the north, which is what I did, uh, Bruce came from uh, further west, and there were a lot of people right there, like in Neptune and the surrounding areas, who, um, who all just, you know, came to the club and met up with your friends, and uh, it was something to do, you know. Did you think about, were, were you guys sitting around thinking about wanting to get out of there and make it in New York? Or? Every minute. Every minute. <laughs> Everybody does that. You know, you want to get out. And, um, and Bruce was the first really to s get out. I mean, he, he actually got an album made and was playing around the country a little bit. And... Um, so things were, after the upstage closed, it was really a, a few years of just going back to nothing, you know. Um, and it really, the scene revitalized when uh, we put the jukes together. And it was kind of an interesting thing because it really is a good way for anybody to do it, really. We just went into a bar that was about to go out of business. Uh, there had been a hurricane or something and the roof was falling in. It was called the Stone Pony. And um, nobody would hire anybody, again, who didn't play the hits. And we just said, look, um, we'll play for the door. You have nothing to lose. And we play what we want, you know. Which we did. And we started one night a week and ended up three nights a week. And they expanded the club, and we had, you know, two, three thousand people at the end, you know. And so, um, all of a sudden, the scene started again, and uh, and particularly at the time where, you know, Bruce being, you know, part of that scene, you know, he'd be there, and everybody would be there, and um, all of a sudden, his Born to Run record hit, I guess which was a big thing, you know, it sold a lot, it was very successful, and uh, all of a sudden people started coming down to Asbury Park, you know, thinking it was the new Liverpool, as they said. <laughs> when did you first meet Bruce? How did you first meet him? There was a scene, you know, um, a, 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 a circuit, I should say, where everybody played in those days. I mean, it was a lot more uh, young, youth-oriented when I started playing. You, um, there was this, uh, these clubs called the Hullabaloo Clubs. Um, there was one in Freehold, one in Middletown, and one in Asbury Park. There were beach clubs, you know, on the, on the coast. There was a, a teenage nightclub. <laughs> <laughs> called Le Teen de Vu. <laughs> God. <laughs> it's funny thinking back on this. Um, and they were high school dances and all kinds of things. So, um, none of which, you know, served alcohol or anything. And, and everybody would play all those places. And you just would run into people. Um, both of our bands were a bit odd. You know, so we were kind of attracted to each other by neither one of us was playing exactly what everybody else was. And then I started running into him uh, on the weekends, you know, he'd sneak up to the village here and see what new music there was, because New York was about a year or two ahead of everywhere else. And I'd see him on the street up here, which was, you know, odd when you see somebody so far from home it was a whole hour away you know which and we just got friendly you know did you ever play it's been it's been interesting kenny was the first person who told me about them then we were talking to southside about them yesterday i'm fascinated by this concept of the battle of the bands oh yeah very very big the battle of the bands um 
I don't remember much about them except my band always won. <laughs> um, usually it was legit. Occasionally um, we'd have a, a judge up there that we knew or something, you know. But uh, yeah, I guess bands would play. I forget if they were required to play the same song. I don't think so. I think you just played three songs and. And you won or you didn't, you know. Your career was over or you went on, you know, to the next beach club. <laughs> Did, um, do you think that, that the amount of time you had to develop and play bars, and uh, do you think that's what's made you into a good musician? Well, I don't know, I don't know about that, but it certainly, um, made me, uh, when your life depends on whether an audience is into it or not, whether you're reaching an audience, whether you're making them dance and react, um, when literally, you know, whether you eat that night or not depends on that, it's a lot different than um, if you just go into a recording studio and put together a record and then, and then start playing, you know. Um, so I think that's very important. I don't think that's happening much anymore, which is part of the reason why there aren't very many good bands. Um, if you look around, I mean, how many bands are really good on stage? I mean, it's appalling how few there are. Um, and I think that's part of the reason. You know, nobody puts those years in to just finding out what works, grow, you know, learn how to how to get something across. Um, it just seems to be happening less and less. You know. It's real interesting because in, in talking to New Jersey musicians over the past couple of days, the thing that, that keeps popping up from everyone is talking about the audience and how important the audience is to them. Mm. That's just a, a natural thing that happened when you, when there was nothing beyond the clubs, beyond the bars or, or whatever. There wasn't any real, um, I mean, the concept of making a record was sort of a fantasy that, you know, you may get there, you may not, but um, you had to find a way to live doing what you wanted to do and still have an audience. Um, at least a few of us who could not play top 40 stuff. I mean, you know, we were stuck. I mean, you either, you either were fantastic or you didn't work. Because the other alternative of playing the hits was just not, you know, we'd rather work in a factory or whatever. You know, it was more meaningful to us than that. So the audiences became very important. I mean, our audience, the Duke's audience was fanatical. I mean, it was a, a whole new kind of audience who, who got used to the fact that they were not hearing songs on the radio. And they were being played songs by groups they never heard of, the Drifters or Sam Cooke or Sam and Dave or whatever it was. And they may have vaguely heard of them. Or, but um, they learned to just enjoy music for uh, the quality of it, you know, the, how, how good was it? I mean, that was the only question they asked. And I think to this day, I mean, I haven't been down there lately, but for many years, it was one of the hippest crowds in, in America because of that. Groups with first albums out would get a great response down there, even though they weren't on the radio, because people learned to judge a band by what is happening right there and then and not uh, that sort of manipulation that the radio encourages, you know. And look at the music that's come out of that. Hmm. That's amazing. Yeah, and I'm sure there's going to be more, you know. How did, you come, how, did, how did it come about you making albums with Southside? Real bad luck. <laughs> <laughs> bad karma. Um, just as I left the band, um, um, I had just been getting a, a tired of it, you know, the bar wars, as I call it. I mean, you just kind of eventually it gets, 
especially in those days, and I don't know if it's probably the same now, but you know, the, you're constantly fighting to, to hang in there. And uh, Bruce was doing a tour and he wanted me to play guitar and I, I thought it would be fun, you know, to get out for a few months. And I ended up staying seven years, but um, uh, at the same time, uh, we got the Jukes a deal. I was sort of still in the band, you know. And then I just, I felt, which was uh, probably um, not exactly realistic looking back on it, but I felt if, if I wasn't in the band, I really shouldn't take, I shouldn't be involved that much. I shouldn't, because I was singing a lot and uh, uh, I thought, you know, well, if I'm not in the band, Johnny, it's got to be Johnny's band, you know. So um, he had to make a, a jump from being this crazy harmonica player who really enjoyed, you know, messing up and showing up late and, you know, doing all the things side men get to do. Um, all of a sudden, he was the boss, you know. I don't think he's ever forgiven me, actually. But I don't know. Anyway, I felt it was the right thing to do because the band was going to have to tour, and I really couldn't do both. And um, and so, um, you know, we convinced the record company that it would be okay without me, and I'd still be there, you know, producing. And, and, um, and that's it. And, you know, they're still going strong today, actually. What was your original concept for Little Steven and the Disciples of Soul? Um, musically. Or musically. Well, I wanted it to be flexible. And on the first record, I really wanted to put... Well, you want to do a lot of things on your first record. You want to... Um, try and express who you are, first of all. Um, um, but musically, I really felt I wanted to finish uh, a certain thing I'd started, and I wanted it to relate to Hearts of Stone, which was the last record I did with the Jukes. Um, it just, I wanted to see um, how far I could take that thing. Uh, that thing being a combination of 60s R&B and, and modern rock and roll, you know, and um, integrate the two and, and see where it went. And so that's what I really did on the first record. Uh, um, after that, I really needed more flexibility and um, I got a little bit tired of no matter what I did, I was always accused of being a, uh, you know, holding up that 60s R&B flag. And um, I didn't really, I didn't, uh, I, I felt I took it as far as I could, you know. And it was time to let horns go, you know, and uh, make music that wouldn't immediately trigger a response in people and, and you know that would ended up being distracting more than evocative uh, so I did that you know I just started broadening the thing you know. and it'll change all the time I guess you know I, I like to have a lot of different things in the, in, in the music a lot of different elements it's very hard to categorize actually which is part of my problem when it comes to radio you know do we need to cut? <coughs> okay.